welcome to this uh, latest Wednesday night on the Grand Strand. Yes, Lord willing, we will complete the Beatitudes tonight. We are covering the eighth Beatitude, and then we'll begin moving faster through the Sermon on the Mount. And so we've looked at seven Beatitudes. And in one way to look at what we've covered so far is, uh, on one hand, the internal work of confession, repentance, and surrender and worship. That leads then to the external work of obedience and integrity, you know, practicing who Jesus is when no one else is looking, and then peacemaking, getting involved in the lives of other people. And so what makes us equipped to obey God and to enjoy full integrity before God and to even take on the role of peacemaker in the world is the internal work that we've already done with Jesus, where we've uh, already begun to live a life of confession, a life of repentance and surrender and worship. So it's dangerous for professed followers of Jesus Christ who want to get in the business of like peacemaking if they haven't done their internal work prior to it, right? Of already living with Jesus and confessing one's sins and repenting and surrendering and worshiping. And so as we said before, each beatitude is a link in the chain to the prior ones or the previous ones before them. And of course, each beatitude begins with the word blessed, which some translate as living the good life or, or happy. Now, do you always feel happy? No, no. You always feel like you're living the good life. Yes, Jesus is saying is that in spite of our, our pain and suffering and, and sometimes down moments, we are at the same time still living the good life in his kingdom, that those two can coexist, that he's not suggesting that, that we will we will live a life where we're always on top of the world and nothing's hurting and nothing's bothering. But even during our down moments, when like you have COVID and you literally care about nothing else in the world except for just not moving and staring at the wall that may or may not have a TV on it, but it really doesn't matter because you're very content just sitting and staring in the nothingness for hours and hours on end. And you begin to have these moments where you think, I don't care about anything. I just absolutely don't care about anything. But even in those moments, one is still living the good life, right? Because one is in Jesus Christ and has things within him or her that always like a trump card, you know, in a game of spades, you know, holds more power than any hand that Satan might throw at us. And so when you're not feeling like you're living the blessed life, um, what should you do when Satan is accusing and suggesting, hey, you're not living the blessed life? I think you should remember what your life was like before you followed Jesus. Okay, so I'm just throwing out some ideas in terms of when you have these crises uh, moments where you're like, I don't know if this Christian life is all it's cracked up to be. I'm not living the blessed life. Uh, what you want to do is, okay, remember what your life was before you followed Jesus. Remember what your life was like when you weren't living a life of confession, a life of repentance, a life of surrender, a life of worship, a life of obedience. And then you will be brought back to reality, right? That while I may not feel like I'm living the blessed life, I in fact am because compared to my previous life that the Apostle Paul calls, you know, rubbish or trash. You know, the Apostle Paul calls his life before Christ is like, it's like dung. It's like excrement. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to go back to that. And so in those moments, if you have tasted the good life in Jesus Christ, when you have these crisis moments, you just remember what life was like. Does that make sense? Okay. And the other thing you might do in these crises moments is ask yourself if you are doing what you are supposed to be doing. Because you may not feel like you're enjoying the blessed life because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. 
The conclusion of Jesus' sermon is what? Do these things. Like the wise man who built his house on a rock. Like put this stuff into practice. And we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount with the intent that we're going to do this stuff. Like these eight Beatitudes, like we're going to do that. And everything we read in this sermon, uh, we're going to like put flesh on it in our lives and actually do it. And so maybe you don't feel like you're living the blessed life at times because you're not doing it. And that makes sense? And um, you also have to ask yourself if you've forsaken the spiritual discipline of gratitude. Maybe you're not feeling it because you stopped being grateful for it. You've actually stopped counting the, the blessings of God that you experience in the Beatitudes. The kingdom of heaven is yours. You know, uh, the comfort you receive when you mourn. Um, inheriting the earth because you are surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. Being filled uh, because you've hungered and thir- thirsted for righteousness. And so you've got to be grateful for those things. So the importance of believing Jesus when he says we are blessed is um, critical because Satan will tell you you're not living the blessed life when in fact you really are. Jesus in these Beatitudes is telling you you're living the blessed life as you experience these conditions, poverty of spirit, mourning, meekness, hunger and thirst or righteousness, uh, mercy. And uh, Satan's going to say that's not the blessed life. The blessed life is fame. The blessed life is fortune. The blessed life is as much comfort as you can get out of this life, as much convenience as you can enjoy in this life, as much power that you have over someone that you can have in this life. And so you really need to just, if, if, you, if you're not telling yourself this, reminding yourself of this, uh, you need to remind your soul, man, I'm living the blessed life. There's no other life I want to live. There's nobody I want to trade places with. No, anybody that I look at, there's nobody that I, I want to say, I want to live their life instead of my life. Because when you're living the blessed life, you know, the good life, you are content and you're not coveting anybody else's life. You, are you living that? You feeling that way? That's the blessed life. And so let's look at the last beatitude in Matthew 5. Verse 10, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Again, Jesus pairs some funny words with the word blessed, and this is another example of that, right? He pairs the word poor with blessed, and mourning with blessed, and hunger and thirst with blessed, meekness with blessed. And here's another Occasion, well, really? You're going to equate persecution and being persecuted with the good life and living the blessed life? So maybe we need to track down what the word persecute actually means. What do you think it means? No right or wrong here. Ashley? To be condemned, Paula? Attack, Joe? Condemned, attacked. Lost your mind? That's not his definition of persecution. He just <laughs> forgot what he was going to say. Jeffrey? Laughed at. Okay. Persecuted. Anybody else? No, paint, those all paint decent pictures. Uh, Joe found it. Punished or ridiculed because of your beliefs. Now, we're just looking. You're right. We're going to look at the word persecuted before we look at for righteousness sake. It may fi- you may find it interesting that the literal definition of persecute is to pursue or chase after or drive away. I want you to think about the word pursue. And so the word persecute can have a negative or positive meaning depending upon context. For instance, when the U.S. Marshal mounts a manhunt for escaped convicts, he's pursuing or persecuting that convict. We're like, yeah, go get him. Pursue him. And so, this, this definition of the word persecuted says something to us about those who persecute. They're tenacious. They're chasing after, pursuing, right? They are dogged in their goal, the object of their persecution. It tells us they have a certain level of commitment and that they are not satisfied 
uh, until a, the quarry is captured or at least sufficiently dealt with. Let me give you some examples in the Bible of this uh, idea of persecution as pursuit or chasing after. In, in John chapter 5, verse 16, you can look at it later, it's one of many examples in the Gospels of how the religious leaders in Jerusalem hounded Jesus, specifically in this verse, over the Sabbath. And you're recalling probably now several times in the gospel story where there are these constant battles with Jesus over his actions on the Sabbath. But all gospel writers give us a good picture of how uh, the religious le leaders are tenacious, right? And dogged in their pursuit of Jesus, their persecution of Jesus. How about uh, Saul before we uh, knew him by his Greek name, Paul? You know, what is he doing in Acts 9, 1 and 2? He's traveling all the way to Damascus for what reason? To persecute Christians. He is pursuing them. And, 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 you know, he didn't just hop on a bus or get an Uber to go from Jerusalem to Damascus. I mean, uh, it's, it's a hard, difficult trip, but it shows you his doggedness, right? Christians are the object of his pursuit or persecution, and he's tenacious. And this one, finally, in Acts chapter 14, verse 19. It says, the Galatian Jews followed Paul the apostle from city to city. Like, they were those people, right? You know, who had their picket signs, et cetera. And uh, when they got wind that Paul had gone down the road to this city, well, they packed up everything, and they went to that city, and they did their protest of Paul there. And when Paul moved on to another city, they were right behind. That shows you that pursuit I want you to feel that dogged uh, persecution. And so this verse actually says, though, uh, blessed are those who are persecuted. That was just a, a sidebar to illustrate those who persecute. But what really Jesus has his mind on are those who are persecuted on the receiving end of that dogged pursuit. And so he's talking about people, if you notice the, the tense there, uh, blessed are, are those who are persecuted. These are people in present tense in the Greek that already have been persecuted, pursued after, and um, stayed the course, right? Stayed the course and did what was right. And so um, as we combine the first beatitude with the eighth beatitude, we begin with um, man humbling himself before God. Lord, I'm poor in spirit. I'm a mess. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. We begin with that accepting who we are, poor in spirit, humbled before God, and now it ends with being humbled by man, being persecuted by other people. So have you ever felt like someone was out to get you in your life? Anybody? Anybody know what that's like, several of you? Kind of know, been on the receiving end for whatever reason. Not necessarily for religious reason, but for some reason, right? You, you got a taste of what it's like to be in the crosshair of, of somebody's craziness. And for reasons you know or maybe don't know, this person just has it out for you. Uh, tell me what that feels like. You don't need to give me the details of why, but I won't. tell me what that feels like. Ashley, frustration, okay, Joe, imprisonment, they're after, they're after me, what happened, yeah, well, anybody else, you feel misunderstood, like, what, what is this about, you just, sometimes we're being persecuted, we don't know why, and we may even ask, can we talk, and they say no, and they're just more contempt to, to like, keep, like, you know, in the context of our memory verse, right, in 2 Corinthians, you know, the battle Paul's facing is a smear campaign. Remember that? People are just saying all kinds of crazy, made-up stuff about him in order to discredit him. And maybe some of you, I certainly have myself, you know, been on the end of smear campaigns like that, minor ones, you know, but nothing that uh, went viral, uh, so to speak. But, man, it's like, oh, man, some people are saying some things about me just aren't true, trying to make me look bad. And there is, to me, 
there's like a helplessness. I, I, I can't change this. I, 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 can't, I can't do anything about this, really. Yeah. Yeah, even if you try to talk to him sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I tried to talk to a guy a couple of weeks ago who was obviously irritated by me. But all he would do was, was mumble as he walked away from me a couple of times. And so I went to him saying, man, can we talk about it? And he just kept walking and mumbling. And so what do you do? There's like nothing else to do, right? And so that leaves you with that sort of helplessness, that mystery, the not knowing. And how many people is he misrepresenting me to? You know, you, all those kinds of things that can come into your head. So Jesus says, surprisingly, you know who's living the good life? Those who are being persecuted or chased after. For what reason, Jesus? Because of righteousness. And you can be persecuted for a variety of reasons besides righteousness. Several years ago, my brother-in-law and I went down to Gainesville, Florida to see our LSU Tigers play the Gators, and the Gators, I'm disappointed to say, won. And as we walked out of before you even left the state, you want to talk about being persecuted just for wearing purple and gold, the nasty things people said. And my brother-in-law has a disability with a, a big limp, and people were just making fun of how he walked, and it was just like, so you can be persecuted for a lot of different things. You can be persecuted because of a past mistake you made. You can be persecuted just because of the color of your skin, right? You can be uh, persecuted for the country you live in, and that's just the only reason why. There are a lot of reasons we might be persecuted. But Jesus equates the good life with those who are being persecuted because of righteousness. Now, you tell me, what's righteousness? Doing what's right? Okay. Following Jesus. Yeah. As Jesus identifies righteousness, correct? It's not just doing what's right. It's about motives and meaning behind what is right. I mean, anybody can do what's right. I mean, atheists can do things that are right. Doesn't mean they are uh, offerings to God, right? Even though they don't believe in God, no. Doing what's right is doing the right thing for the right reason for the right one. And that's how Jesus describes righteousness here. Um, and that's who this blessing is reserved for. So it's interesting that Jesus ends the previous beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers, with this beatitude. Because guess what's going to happen when you get in the business of peacemaking? When you get in the business of getting involved in people's lives in both church and community? Um, not everyone's going to love you for it. <laughs> Not everyone's going to say thank you uh, because of your efforts, right? Uh, there are people who are going to misconstrue, who are just going to dislike and be upset with you in spite of your best efforts to make peace between you and him or between him and her or however it might be. They're just, there are going to be a lot of people who are not going to like you because of it. When you live a a, a life devoted to Jesus that is highly visible, and we get to that next week, salt of the earth, light of the world. You're just who you are, wherever you are, and that shows, and everybody's not going to love you for it. Um, you are going to be persecuted uh, for righteousness, for following Jesus. And so that indicates, listen, this is, means you have a choice in the matter. I mean, you can choose to do what's right by Jesus, or you can choose to avoid trouble by not doing what's right by Jesus. You get my drift? You have that choice all the time. And we're going to say more about it in a minute. Have you ever noticed how people like me don't include verses 11 and 12 in the Beatitudes as a separate beatitude. I mean, there are some teachers that say there are nine beatitudes, and, and I'm teaching you that there are eight. But then, verse 11 begins with the word blessed too, right? 
So um, let's read it. Verse 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here's why I don't count this as a ninth beatitude. Number one, its form does not match the form of the previous eight beatitudes, right? Just a succinct condition and blessing. And as you can tell, it just doesn't match the previous eight, right? Also, in verse 11 and 12, uh, the theme is still persecution, as it was in verse 10. So it seems like verse 11 and 12 is just shedding some further light on that beatitude in regards to persecution. What further light? Well, specifically, Jesus identifies you'll be insulted. That'll be a form of persecution. People will falsely say all kinds of uh, false things about you and um, all kinds of evil things. And um, then he says, and they say those things because of me. So you got verse 10, you're persecuted because of righteousness. You got verse 11, you're persecuted because of me. And as you said, righteousness is Jesus. Jesus is righteousness. And so if you're following Jesus, if you're taking these seven steps with Jesus, uh, the eighth step is learning how to walk with Jesus while everybody doesn't love you. It's learning how to walk with Jesus while people actually dislike you. Yeah, you. You're so likable. And you just mean good all of the time. You want to love everybody. And there are people that still don't like you. In fact, they can't stand you. Some of them, even family members, neighbors, when you're not around, they talk about you. And they even make up stuff about you. They say things that have absolutely no basis in reality whatsoever. I was reading this interesting article on the history of anti-Semitism in the world. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing story how there have always been movements of anti-Semitism, right, through history. You know, a thousand years in Europe, there were just these constant threads of and, you know, I've been, asked, like, I've been asking myself for weeks now, like, how did that get started? I mean, I know what it was about in the promised land, right? You know, enemies surrounding the fight for land and tribe. But, like, how did this all go bonkers, like, in Europe for a thousand years? And, and it's just like, here it is. It has no basis in reality. These sort of, you know, tropes of Jewish people are ruling the world, and so that's why we got to get rid of them, and that's why we got to, you know, you know, burn their homes, you know, and that's why in the Crusades we just ought to kill them because, you know, they killed Jesus back, you know, on the cross. And so we, you know, it's just no basis in reality other than, it is human nature to want to blame societal, society's ills on a group of people. Uh, you, can, you can trace that, that all the way through human history. We've got to blame somebody. And so when, like, in, in Europe, at, at periods of time when, like, life is hard and life is tough and the economy is a mess, we've got to blame somebody. And oftentimes it was the Jewish people. Even when many of them were poor like everybody else, <laughs> it was the Jewish people. And so my, my illustration is that sometimes the things that people say about you in your own life have no basis in reality either. It's just false, right? It is just evil. And as we've been thinking about, you know, it's crazy. And you can't fight crazy with what? Crazy. Because if you do, you become what? Crazy. I don't think I'll ever use this in a sermon illustration. <laughs> so I'll tell you special folks on Wednesday night. 
Like Don and I are leaving the recycling center a couple Saturdays ago, and it's five miles an hour as you're leaving before you get to the stop sign. And uh, if there's anybody at fault for this, it's Mr. Tom. Because after I'm exiting, I call Mr. Tom and say, I'm on my way over. And as I'm about to hang out with Mr. Tom, and I'm doing my five miles an hour, this car zooms past me in the wrong lane and cuts right in front of me. And I say, I'll see you in a minute, Mr. Tom. And then I balked. Like the car almost hit me. You want to go 30 miles an hour? All right. It almost hit me. And she stops at the stop sign, and I'm behind her, and she opens up her door and gets halfway out and says, get off your phone, as if it's illegal to talk on the cell phone. It is in a number of states, but it's not in South Carolina. And I'm like, what? I rolled down my window. You, you think the worst things about me. I said, it's five miles an hour through here. Subtly saying, it doesn't matter whether it's my phone or not. I'm going the speed limit. It doesn't affect you whatsoever. And she says, you shouldn't be on your phone. And this is, this is the illustration. I went, and I was like, no. I rolled up the window. You can't fight crazy with crazy. I'm about to become a crazy person if I continue this conversation. You know, my sweet wife, you know, she's like, what possesses a person to do that? <laughs> you know? Well, we're all a little crazy sometimes, and you can't fight crazy with crazy. Sometimes the attacks of those who persecute you have no basis in reality. Sometimes they might have a tinge, but sometimes they do not. And so... Um, Happy are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Jesus says, rejoice and be glad. Now, we're going to talk about how you do that when you're not feeling so good about what somebody just said or did to you. But fast back from John chapter 3. Let's look at verses 20 and 21. John 3, you know verse 16 very well. But maybe you haven't read verse 20 and 21 of John 3 in a while. Jesus says, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. What do those two verses just teach you or say? What is Jesus saying here? There seem to be like two possible results that will come in your life once you decide to follow Jesus, Joe. So here's what's going to happen. Uh, as you follow Jesus and live this good life in front of other people, some people are going to hate you and avoid you, and some people are going to join you and love you. And so you got to be aware of those two potential outcomes. Some people, when you're around, your light is going to expose their darkness, and they're going to say, well, we're not inviting him to the next party. <laughs> we're not inviting him when the group goes out to lunch, you know, at work, you know, because, because your behavior, your light exposes darkness, and people sometimes do not like that, and so they do not like you. And then some people, when you're around, they're like, how did you get what you got? You know, tell me about it. There's a peace about you I've never seen before. There's like this joy that I don't understand why you, why you have that and I don't. And some people are going to want to be around you. So here it is. Here's your eighth step. Listen closely. What kind of people, you're going to answer this, what kind of people Choose doing right by Jesus when they know it is going to end in persecution for them by doing so. What kind of people choose to do right by Jesus when they know that I'm going to get persecuted, that 
People are going to pursue me and criticize me or mistreat me, leave me out or falsely accuse me, and yet I'm doing what's right when you know what the cost is going to be. You see what I'm asking you? What, what enables a person who knows the consequences that may come to still choose Jesus over the consequences? Joe? The person not living for right now. First, person not living for the future instead of right now. That's good, Steve. A person who has conviction in his beliefs and therefore is self-confident and courageous. He's like on the right path. As we like to say, come, I'll clean it up for you since you think so yield of me. Come Hades or high water, right? This conviction is going to trump whatever the high water that might come in your life. Tommy. Mm, Jesus trumps all that. Jesus' approval Jesus' pursuit of your, you and saving of you trumps anything somebody can throw at you. Let me read you two scriptures, John 15, verse 19. Jesus said, John 15, verse 19, if you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, Joseph, but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. Did you hear it? Why does the world hate you as a follower of Jesus Christ? Because by virtue of your life, people around you know they aren't like us. They live like there's something beyond the here and now. They live like there's something bigger than what the earth can offer a person. And then 1 Timothy 3, verse 12. No, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's not a question of if you will ever be the target of someone's animosity. It's only a question of when and how that will come into your life. And so here's how I uh, summarize this eighth step. The kind of people who are willing to be persecuted because of righteousness. Why? You've kind of said it in your own words. This is how I say it. Uh, The kind of people who live by a code instead of by the consequences. Let me flesh that out for you. So the people Jesus is describing, they live by this code, by this conviction, you know, by this belief. In other words, they make their decisions about what I'm going to do based on this code. Not based on, well, what is it going to cost me if I do this? Well, let's kind of flesh this out and let's kind of look at all the scenarios and how much pain might come and discomfort, and then I'll decide. You know, that's living by the consequences. And many people in the world, that's how they live their life 24-7. Not by any code or conviction, only by what's best for me at any given moment. So let me give you an example of both sides. Uh, Go to Daniel chapter 3. This is like one of my favorite passages that demonstrate the idea demonstrates the idea of living by a code instead of by the consequences. You know the three young boys, what are their names? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. You know the story very well. The king of Babylon has this 99-foot, I think, or 90-foot statue. Everybody in the kingdom is ordered to worship. And these boys are like, we're not worshiping that statue. No, sir. We worship God, the one true and only God. We're not worshiping a bunch of metal. And the statute says if one does not, he is to be thrown in the fiery furnace. That's that's your consequence. And so here it is. 
All right, fellas, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we're going to live by the code, which is there's only one true God, and we only worship him. Commandment one, right? No other gods beside me or before me. Commandment two, no other idols. Like, that's the code. Are we going to live by the code? Or we're going to fry. We live by the code. How about we don't live by the code just, just for a couple hours? Like, cross our fingers, you know, and like bow down before the idol and then get back home and then that didn't count. That was just make believe, you know, to avoid the consequence. And of course, you know what they say, some of my favorite verses, uh, verse um, 16, 17, 18. King, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter, verse 17. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, God we serve is able to save us from it. He will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. They've got no guarantee of tomorrow, right? They know that all things is is possible with God. He can, like, save you from the fire furnace, but they don't know if God will or won't, right? And so here's an example of, like, We're sold out on this code of truth, which is God. And you can threaten us with any kind of consequence to sway us from that, but we don't play ball. I mean, we live by this code. Let me give an example of another one you know well. This is Peter and John in Acts 4, 18 and 19. They've been arrested for preaching Jesus, and now they are being threatened. You know, if they go back and start to talk about Jesus, like, hey, if you get back out there and start talking about Jesus again... You know what's coming your way. And you remember what they said? We can't help but talk about what we've seen and heard. We must obey God rather than men. In other words, yeah, we hear the consequences that could come our way. Um, And you could pursue us and persecute us and hit us with those. But we don't live by the threat of consequence. We don't make our decisions based on what's more comfortable for us and what's in it for us in any given moment. We base our decisions on what is true, this code of truth, which is God himself. I mean, that's the way Jesus lived his life. Boys, I'm telling you, when I get to Jerusalem, they're going to arrest me. They're going to pummel me. They're going to insult me. They're going to flog me, and they're going to kill me. But I'm going because I'm on a mission to save the world and do to God's will. That's my code. And so all the consequences that are coming my way, they don't enter the picture because I'm sold out on this code. Okay, so that's the example of people living by this code of truth instead of by one's consequences. Let me give you a couple of examples from Scripture of individuals who live by the consequences instead of by the code, at least for a period of time. Peter, as Jesus is uh, in court, sits outside in a courtyard. Why did Peter deny knowing Jesus three times? There are going to be some consequences. If you say, yeah, I'm all about Jesus. You know, there are going to be some consequences. He felt that. And in that moment in time, he chose to live by the consequences instead of by what was true. He chose to try to save himself some pain and discomfort rather than to hold on to what he knew in his heart to be true. The other examples in Acts chapter 5, 1 through 4, Ananias and Sapphira, two Christians who are are wanting to be generous, like a lot of people are being generous, uh, but they, uh, they want to give a false impression of just how generous they're going to be. So they give the impression that they're giving all the proceeds from a recent sale of land to the kingdom of God, even though they're only giving a part of the proceeds. Now, they were under no obligation to give any of the proceeds, right? This is a free gift. But they knew that if if they said we're only giving part of the proceeds, well, the consequence is what? Well, you don't look as impressive. You don't look as impressive as a lot of these folks that are giving all. So the consequence could be, you know, feeling bad, looking bad, at least in their own eyes. They didn't want that. 
So I don't want that consequence. I want everybody thinking I'm really a wonderful Christian who's just generous. I want, I want them thinking that. So they lie, right? Instead of living by the truth, which is, hey, here's part of the proceeds. Uh, Sapphira and I, we're going on vacation with the other part of the proceeds. But this is, you know, this is what we're giving. And that had been fine with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, right? But they don't want to live by that consequence. So you see the difference? Can you see it in your life? When you have to kind of weigh, am I going to live by the code of truth or by the consequences? I'll get us started with some examples of how we live in this domain and in that moment of time when we have to make a decision, which one is it going to be? And then you can add to the list. One of the easiest examples of this that most of us can identify with is in a, let's say, mall parking lot where we open our door and accidentally ding somebody's car. Or maybe we're pulling into a space and we accidentally just crust off just a little bitty paint off of their, their, their back end of their car. And you get out and you look and, yeah, you see. And you see your car, yeah, that, that color paints like on my car. And then you start looking around. <laughs> if you're living by the consequences. Like, anybody see that? And this is where you're going to find out who you are. Because the consequences, it'd be one big headache. You know, what, who knows what it's going to cost me? And, you know, I got I to gotta get out my car and get out a piece of paper and write a note and put it on the windshield with my phone number. And I, I got to get in there and do what I came here to do. And everything now to a grinding halt. And so you're weighing all the consequences of how this could go south in a hurry. But what's true? You hit that car. You scraped a little paint off. And in that moment, you have to decide... Do I live by this code of truth, which is what is true is what is true, and I deal with the consequences that come, or do you just kind of rationalize? Well, they probably won't notice and go about your business. Is that a good example? Good example of how to weigh those? Let me keep going with a couple more. It is tax season, after all. And some of you maybe. be... Um, have some income that comes in that old Uncle Sam will never know about unless you tell him, right? Isn't that possible? Yeah. Yeah, Uncle Sam doesn't know how much I get paid for funerals and weddings every year. He'd never know. He, how's he going to know? Am I right? Well, my wife has to ask me that question every year. <laughs> how much did you make? Before I do my taxes, I was like, can't you ever forget to ask that question? <laughs> you know? Don't ask, don't tell policy, Donna. Can we have that around here? But seriously, you know, tax season, like, am I living by the code of truth? Which is, all right, this is, a, this is what I made, and you'll never know it, but I know it, and God knows it. And so it's by law that I got to, like, report my income. It's easy to rationalize, is it not? Not to live by the truth, but to live by the consequences, which is my bottom line is not going to be as good if I report this extra cash that I received as income. Okay, is that a good example of how we discover if we're living by a code of truth or living by the consequences? Or another example, you're late for work and you got some explaining to do. Yeah. Are you just going to tell the truth? Hey, I overslept. Or you're thinking about how that's not going to play to the boss. And maybe you say, well, I saw an accident on the interstate, as if you were stopped by an accident on the interstate, and you get some kind of, like, blame sort of embellishment. Been there before? These kind of crossroads moments, you know. Um, here's one. Ooh, true story. When you, they all. <laughs> they all. Well, this is like a personal story from somebody. 
No, it's true. I'll read it to you. It came out of a book. It's got to be true. It came out of a Christian book. You know it's true. So settle down, people. Y'all are bad. Bad, bad, bad. Saw it on the internet, Karen. In 2016, Armando Valadares, you can Google this, was awarded the Canterbury Medal from the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. Valadares is a Christian who worked a desk in communist Cuba. When he was 23 years old, he was ordered to put a sign on his desk saying, I am with Fidel, a reference to the communist dictator, Fidel Castro. <coughs> Valadares had seen the murderous regime of Castro, and as a Christian, Valadares refused to say he was with Fidel. He's like, no, that's not going on my desk. And for the offense, he was imprisoned for 22 years. Here it is. You're going to live by the code of truth or by the consequences? I can keep that on my desk and give this impression I'm all about Fidel. Or I can live by the truth. Quote, he says, all of that time, 22 years, I endured hunger, systematic beatings, total darkness, filth, disease, sweltering heat, hard labor, and solitary confinement. 8,000 days of struggling to prove that I was a human being. 8,000 days of proving my spirit could triumph over exhaustion and pain. His faith in Jesus, prayers, and memories of this church kept him alive, positive, and loving. He, to have succumbed to what he knew to be wrong would have constituted, he later said, spiritual suicide. Like, if I let him put that on my desk and gave the false impression, that would be like spiritual suicide to me. Staying with Jesus, he said, was true freedom even being in prison for 22 years was true freedom. Quote, even though my body was in prison and being tortured, my soul was free and it flourished. My jailers took everything from me, but they could not take away my conscience or my faith. That's a pretty good example, is it not? Living by a code of truth instead of by the consequences What's our code? Rather, who's our code? It's Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. What's our code? It's the Bible. All Scripture is inspired by God and, and, and given to bless us in numerous ways. So that's our code, right? That's when it comes down to it. It's like, what does Jesus say? What does the Bible say? And just, we just, that's what we roll with. That's the final word. That's the only word, you know, in our lives. That is our code. And if that, that doesn't mesh, with what the world demands and what the world wants, guess who's going to lose every time in our lives? The world. If that doesn't give me easy street in my life, guess who's not going to live on easy street? That's me, right? If it's going to make my life harder to follow Jesus, guess what? I'm signing up for a harder life because I'm living by the truth, this code of truth named Jesus and not by the consequences. There are alternative codes, I will say. One is feeling. I live by my feelings. That's my code. Another is personal opinion. This is what I think. Another is the government. Well, the government says, so that's got to be true. Or public opinion is the code of somebody else, right? And this is kind of what public opinion is. It opens the door, I would say, to all kinds of craziness in the world. These alternative codes, I'll give you a few examples. It opens the door to people saying things like, uh, men can give birth to. Men can have babies. When you live by an alternative code rather than the code of Jesus and Scripture. This was a personal one with me as I was working with unbelievers in a Bible study years ago. You know, her, her code of truth was just her feeling, personal opinion. And so when I asked her what color the, the, the coffee table was, typical brown, she said, um, well, it's green to me. If I say it's green, then that table is green. Because that's how I feel about it. Well, what are you going to say to that? 
But I'm saying these alternative codes leads to all kinds of craziness in our world. You know, if lying gets me the job, well then, all right, let's lie. You know, if greed is good and gets me more of what I want, well then greed is good. You see what happens? You see how the world gets so crazy? When we don't live by this code of truth named Jesus Christ. I'm almost done and my voice is almost gone. The blessing, you tell me. Jesus says the blessing of living your life this way is the kingdom of heaven. It began in Beatitude 1, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs, you see the bookends, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and the Beatitude 8, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does that look like or feel like for you, this blessing of living your life by this code? And you really have to talk because I'm really, I got water here, what am I thinking? I'm almost out. What does that look like or feel like? Ashley? Okay. It looks like, man, there's a great reward coming. Jesus said that in a number of different ways. You know, you haven't given up, those of you who gave up everything to follow me, you're getting a lot, right? Karen? Mm. Mm-hmm. It lets you know you're on the right path. You know, that's what being persecuted, Jesus says, it lets you know you're on the right path. You're doing something right when you're persecuted because of him. Not because you're persecuted for doing something wrong or persecuted just because of how you look, but you're persecuted because of your association with Jesus in some way. And Jesus says, that lets you know you're on the right path, man. You're like with me because that's how they treated me and that's how they treat you. Keep going. What does it look like? You can face death. The martyrs of the first century, the martyrs of the 21st century can face death with this overwhelming peace that passes understanding, right? Because they're thinking, killing me is only going to improve my life in about a nanosecond, right? Because I'm with Jesus. Good one. Joe? World is not my home, so it reminds me of where my true citizenship is. That's a great blessing to know. Anybody else? Uh, uh, Stephen? Okay. All right, let, me, let, me, let me put it this way, then we'll close. It's one of the great blessings, I think, in, in my life, and I think it's true in your life. When you live by the code of Jesus, there are so many scenarios that would be perplexing in a number of ways for various people that are not perplexing for us. Like, I don't have to have a, I don't have to have a, and you don't have to have a two-second conversation with yourself about whether you're going to report that ding you put on somebody's car or not. I don't have to have a two-second conversation about whether I'm going to report that money to the IRS or not. You follow me here? Whereas if you're living by the consequences, you're agonizing, fretting over, let's make a list of positives and negatives, you know, pros and cons. Like, there are things I don't need to pray about. Like, telling the truth? Like, I don't need to pray about that. You don't need to pray about it. You know, I, I've got to tell the truth. I was late for work because I overslept. I'm not going to lie to you. You see how life in many ways becomes easier? When you follow this code, I mean, so many people are living double and triple and quadruple lives, and what they're trying to really do is manage life, right? And this is how it works in the political world, by the way. It's really not as important as what's true as it is what's going to play and what's going to work in response to this or that. I wish politicians would learn the lesson of uh, that Israeli commander who is by and large uh, one of the few responsible for the failing of the Israeli army, you know, that day in October. And he is now the most popular commander politician in Israel, and here's why. He's one of the few that said, I blew it. I blew it. I was asleep at the wheel. And you know what? People love a person that can tell the truth, admit it, 
and pledge to do better. You know who they can't get behind? Those who obfuscate and pass blame. And when they're asked a specific question about how it happened, they don't answer the question about how it happened. But it's a great example of how a, a military leader can like take responsibility. It didn't end his career. It put him on a new trajectory because people can identify with that, right? We all blow it. And like if you would just own it and tell the truth, right? It makes life easier instead of making up stuff and blaming others. And so I think that's, for me, one of the great blessings of, of living, living by this code. Um, I, don't, I don't have to decide where I'm going to be on Sunday. You know, I'm, I live by this code. Jesus is first. I'm worshiping him with his church. It's like there's no conversation. Um, okay, I got, I got to really stop. But my daughter, yeah, I don't think, yeah, there's nothing bad in it. It's not, I can recommend it, even for the very uh, sensitive. She messaged me two days ago and said, Dad, you got to see this Saturday Night Live skit they did on church while you're on vacation. Because we always went to church while on vacation. And there's a skit of this family in Ohio at church on Sunday morning in Jamaica. And the two kids are like, why can't we just miss one Sunday? And it, it's, it's pretty funny, you know. But it's like, you know, for, for some, it's like, there's no conversation. You know, the guy in the skit is like, church is church wherever we are, right? And so here we are in Jamaica. Did we go to church in Ireland, kids, two years ago? Yeah. Well, we're, it's no different than Jamaica. We go to church on Sunday. It's just, there's just a lot of things that just make life easier. We don't have to have conversations about because we live by this code of truth. If, man, somebody I know is hurt by me, the code of truth says, Jay, you got to go talk to them. There's no, well, I don't know if it'll work or not. I don't know if I really want to do that or not. It becomes easy. Like when, when I knew this fellow was upset at me and mumbled a couple times, like, well, you got to go to this guy. You know, and so you got to go try. And so I went and tried, and it didn't work, and now it's on him. But it was like no conversation. I mean, I, I saw it, and the next time I saw him by himself, five minutes later, I went to him. There was no conversation to be had whether you go talk to him or not, right? It's like easy in that. Are you feeling it? You feeling the good life that comes by living by this code and being persecuted for doing righteousness because the alternative to not is this crazy train, is it not? Bless your hearts. You've got hands up. I'm already four minutes over. I've got to close with the prayer. Lord God, thank you for these beautiful people who've gathered here tonight. Fill them with your righteousness as they hunger and thirst for you. God, send to our church people no one else loves so that we can love them like Jesus does. Bless our children and their parents, God, that each home tonight might enjoy peace, might enjoy great joy and love and security within them. And we pray, God, as we leave tonight, we will be covered and filled with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody, for being here.